said to the players, like, you, you beat Freo, they beat Melbourne, we can beat them now. You know, like, it doesn't work that way, we know. But um, we, we've, we've always said from day one that we want to act like winners and we're going to have winning habits and behaviours in everything we do. Craig McRae, the coach post-game, Collingwood over Carlton, the old rivals in front of 80,000-plus at the MCG in the end, getting up, winning by four points in an absolute thriller. Carlton easily could have stolen the game. I guess it's got Pies fans wondering today how far they can go this season, particularly given they've now beaten Fremantle and Carlton, both touted as potential premiers or certainly rivals to the Demons this year. The Pies were absolutely magnificent, as were the Blues. It was a great, great game of football. A big story to come out of it, of course, is Jacob Wiedering. He's the Blues' star defender. Suffered an AC joint injury, a shoulder injury yesterday. Was subbed out of the game. It changed the composition of the game. And it's got the capacity to change the composition of Carlton's season. I'll get to their injury shortly. But in terms of the... That's the growing list. But in terms of the latest, I heard from the Blues today, they expect it to be a significant one. They say possibly around six weeks or so, but they won't have confirmation until Weedering's consulted a specialist, and they'll likely know for sure either tonight or tomorrow morning. Now, just to explain, this is an AC shoulder joint. We know Jack Steele at St Kilda suffered what looks like a similar injury. That's cost him seven weeks plus. That required surgery in that instance. And uh, I spoke to Michael Roberts, who was doing the boundary for Triple M yesterday. And just to paraphrase what Robbo told me up in the media area, he saw it and noticed it would really popped out of its socket and was right up sort of you know, pressing against the skin. So it was a bad, bad shoulder injury. And uh, Michael Voss said as much post-game. More on the major end um, than the minor end. So he'll he'll go see the surgeon um, early this week and we'll decide whether he has uh, surgery. So um, if it ventures into that space, we're, we're probably more talking a, more a longer term, five or six weeks um, than anything else. So um, there's some challenges in that. And, you know, I've spoken to the group about that you get thrown spanners. Um, you know, every team does throughout the season and you get challenged at different times and um, and through those periods of time, which is what we've done, we've been able to find a way. And The Blues beautifully placed mid-season. I'm sure their supporters would have taken it. It's been a magnificent start to the year, but they do have now a growing injury list. Mackay, Williams, Weedering and Pitney to name a few. There might be some discussion as to regarding whether they could afford to lose at all yesterday. They played Carroll as the sub. Maybe they should have played Jack Martin or Kemp. I think Kemp might come back into the side now. But uh, it was a costly day for the Blues, and we'll get the full assessment from Carlton. But they're looking, I understand, at at least six weeks plus. It could be longer with a uh, AC joint if it requires surgery. But we'll know that for sure, and we'll update that on our on our social channels. From a Pies perspective, as I mentioned, they can sort of dare to dream now in a way. They'll get a really good test against Melbourne on Queen's birthday. Uh, Mason Cox was great yesterday. I thought bought the bought the ball to the ground beautifully, kept it out in front of him. Side bottom was good too. And Darcy Cameron played an absolutely magnificent game. In terms of the mid-season draft, it's now going to come at an interesting time for both Carlton and Collingwood. The Blues are looking at Sam Durden to uh, replenish their defensive stocks. That's obviously on Wednesday. They've got two picks. They don't know at this stage whether they'll use both of those picks. The Pies also have two picks. They're meeting regarding that today. But uh, I think they'd obviously definitely look at a defender if they could find one, given that uh, Ruffy, Jordan Ruffy, retired last week. Just for some context regarding that retirement, um, his shoulder injury was terribly bad when he did it. And in the end, it just couldn't get up. But uh, he's certainly the heart and soul of the Pies team. He's enormously popular down there. And I wouldn't be surprised if they'd look for a uh, increased off-field role for him in time. He's already got some great involvement with the AFLW team. It was a great day for the Pies yesterday. They're just pressing on the eight. And they've knocked off a couple of big scalps in consecutive weeks. Bobby Hill, the popular giant, a big story from the weekend. GWS revealing yesterday in a press release that he unfortunately... He's suffering from testicular cancer. And just to point to the circumstances here and his selfless act, Hill played for the Giants on Saturday and uh, laid a few tackles and kicked one of the early goals. So he uh, obviously knew that they needed a small forward and, uh, and put his hand up. He'll have treatment and I think surgery early this week. I've spoken to his manager, Colin Young, who's certainly optimistic about the outcome. It's not for me to share details from a medical perspective, but you know, this, to summarise our conversation, I think they certainly they've got the impression that they've picked it up nice and early, and uh, Hill's hoping to play footy later in the year. There's a sort of, tr- I don't want to make it about a trade story, it's about his health, but uh, Hill's also hoping next year to come back to Victoria and play footy, but uh, first off, he's got this very serious health battle, and our thoughts obviously with Bobby Hill, who's having some treatment for a testicular cancer diagnosis this week. Best of luck to Bobby. He's a beauty. 
The discussion behind the scenes regarding Tasmania has the potential to get heated this week. That's from one club president who I spoke to over the weekend. A separate club president, Andrew Pridham, who I interviewed for Seven News on Friday night, told me that he's got some reservations about a 19th team. That's the Swans now have reservations about a 19th team. He's pro-Tasmania, but against a 19th team. One aspect to all this discussion is the money that the Tasmanian government, their consortium, will contribute to a Tasmanian team. Caroline Wilson, I think in summary, has reported a figure of around about $150 million over 10 years, which is roughly $15 million per year. There's a strong view from a lot of the clubs at the moment that that's an insufficient amount. A, it's not enough per year because uh, a lot of teams, the Suns and GWS included, lose significantly more money than that. And B, a 10 or 15 year guarantee on the part of the Tasmanian government, let's call it 10 for the moment, is insufficient. It's taken a long, long time for GWS and the Suns to even get to this point, and they're still losing money hand over fist. And the clubs, including the big ones and Sydney don't, and Gold Coast, have already expressed concern over this, don't want to get lumped with a bill on an ongoing basis for a team. One source of their concern, some of the big clubs, including Collingwood's, is that at the moment the AFL don't even pay those clubs full salary cap. So it's unfair at a time to ask the clubs to approve a Tasmanian team, which is going to cost a lot of money and potentially expose the clubs to financial liability at a time when the AFL is not even funding some of the big sides, West Coasts, Collingwoods, Hawthorns, to name a few, full salary cap. At the moment, the salary cap's roughly $13 million. They're only getting about $8 million or so this year, so they're at least $5 million short on their own salary cap. There is a strong view among some clubs, and this is a valid discussion amongst the clubs. North do not want to move. There's no support from North to move. But there's a strong view amongst sub-clubs that the right decision and Gil McLaughlin's actual preference would be for North to do a cooperative agreement with Tasmania. Now, Gil clearly can't get that up, and I haven't directly asked him on that point recently. But that's the view of the clubs, that even Gil McLaughlin sees that as the best solution. That's not going to happen at the moment. So what's happening at the moment is the AFL is going to ask the clubs to vote on whether to approve a Tasmanian team. The clubs, some of them are coming back saying, well, don't ask us to vote on this. It's not really fair. We all know what the right decision is, which is Tasmania to partner up with an existing club. We do approve of Tasmania. We do approve of Tasmania having a good football outcome, but we don't approve of issuing a 19th team. Don't lump this on us. There's growing pressure on the AFL now behind the scenes for the commission to make this decision and making the club's view the right one. So the clubs are sort of pushing back on being, the, they don't want to be seen as the bad guys here. There's support for Tasmania, but there's not support from a 19th licence. It's getting heated behind the scenes. One aspect to all this discussion, of course, is the talent. The mid-season draft isn't exactly full of chock, chock full of talent. And there's this idea that uh, Tasmania will suddenly start breeding footballers to you know, make up 40 or 50 list spots going forward. That's going to put a big drain on the existing clubs. So it's a very robust discussion now behind the scenes. As I said, there's support in principle for Tasmania. There's not a lot of support among some of the clubs, Sydney included, for a 19th licence, and it's getting heated behind the scenes. Some big talking points I want to whip through from the weekend. Sydney, there was some controversy at the end of that game, in particular the non-50 metre penalty. Look, I think depending on who you barrack for or support, you can take a different position on all that. Um, In the end, it was the, uh, I guess, fair outcome just from a common sense perspective, having said that, Damien Harvick wasn't too too uh, interested in the common sense argument, tweeting common sense with one of his memes on Twitter, which could be looked at from the AFL on Friday night. Buddy Franklin kicked five goals. I voted on the O'Loughlin Goods medal, um, part of a media contingent that voted on that. I gave Buddy three votes, gave Warner two votes, and uh, I thought Daniel Rioli played a great game, so I gave him a vote for the Tigers. But uh, that was a very interesting, controversial decision regarding that 50-metre penalty, which has created a lot of discussion. I don't think it was deliberate, because I think that uh, it was Warner, wasn't it, uh, thought that the siren had gone. And Tony Jones made a good point on the footy show yesterday. I think it was one-third of a second between the umpire blowing his whistle for the free kick and the siren going. The other interesting point, of course, that I think the Herald Sun made accurately over the weekend is that the game officially ends when the umpire concludes um, with his own whistle that the game has ended. So, you know, you could argue that it uh, should have been 50 metres. Anyway, I guess we'll debate that point all week. 
perhaps uh, could require some clarification from the AFL as well. The Demons had their first loss of the year. Fremantle went Wooshka in the third quarter. Coming over from Perth, of course, they played Collingwood the week before, kicked eight goals to one. The Demons, Petrarca was sick, had 10 touches, but clearly had gastro or flu or something like that. Interesting, the importance of Ed Langdon. Hawthorne pushed Melbourne earlier in the year, tagged Langdon. Langdon didn't play on the weekend, and uh, clearly he's important from a running perspective and an important player, in my view, for the Demons. Um, Stephen May also suffered concussion, should be back according to the protocols, provided he's right, of course, for Queen's birthday. West Coast continue to be a massive, massive story, in my view. Frankly, I'm scratching my head. They're one of the richest clubs. They've got, you know, seriously smart board, seriously smart uh, CEO, Trevor Nisbet, and a, a very well-regarded president. They lost by 101 points again. They were completely uncompetitive against the Bulldogs. This traces back to when they didn't want to go in the hub. I've played you the grab before when they said that uh, the hub was a bridge too far, and ever since then, they've been going downhill at a rate of knots. I think there'll be some focus on the Tim Kelly trade again. I know he played pretty good footy on Saturday night, but they gave up three, well, the equivalent of two or three first-round draft picks for Tim Kelly. It's beginning to look like a disastrous deal. It was post-grand final. Perhaps they thought they could win another premiership. Who can blame them? But it's looking like a more costly deal by the minute, particularly with some of their ageing veterans playing some pretty ordinary football. The Suns annihilated Hawthorne, who have been inconsistent by 67 points up in Darwin, um, interesting, Stuart Jew. Mark Evans spoke to us, Mitch Cleary, for Seven News pre-game on Saturday night, saying that their performance in the second half of the year will ultimately determine, determine Dew's contract fate. But he's certainly on the right track. I still think they're at least considering in the background, and I reported this on this podcast last week, extending him. Having said that, it seems like they've got to keep winning, and it's an important month for Stuart Dew. But the Suns played really, really good football. I followed Matt Rowell's game um, closely. I know he plays a big team role. Luke Darcy pointed that out on air, but uh, he didn't get a lot of the ball, so there'll be some focus this week perhaps on his performance. And as I mentioned earlier, Collingwood outside the eight now, only on percentage. Um, Four-point winners yesterday. It was a magnificent win. Some news briefs briefly. Um, so the Swans are considering still whether to appeal Buddy Franklin's one-match sanction. They could look at whether that's in careless rather than intentional. I don't like their chances of success. They're probably sub 50%. Having said that, they might roll the dice. I mentioned Damien Harvick. The AFL might look at his Twitter this week. He's tweeted on the score review and the common sense aspect of the 50-meter penalty consecutively in uh, in two weeks. Uh, you know, I think he's testing the AFL's patience on that. North Melbourne has uh, got a vacancy, a key one in their recruiting department. I think they'll look at Stephen Silvani. You could see uh, the great work that Soss has done on Carlton's list this year. He had a personality f um, falling out, if you like, with Kane Little at Carlton. But notwithstanding that, he's clearly a gun recruiter. And I think the Kangaroos will look at him for that role as well. It's been a massive, massive day of news in footy. We'll have all the latest, of course, on our social channels during the week. I'm going to do a special uh, news update tomorrow because I missed Friday flying up to Sydney. It was a great weekend of footy. Triple M rocks football. I'll be back for all the latest, including on Jacob Wiedering tomorrow. That was Tom Brown's news. Come back every Monday, Thursday and Friday for more and subscribe to Triple M footy on Listener or wherever you listen to get all our podcasts throughout the season. For Ream Hot Water and McDonald's, Triple M rocks footy.